1 Timothy chapter 3. Starting at verse 1. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honourable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above a reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control live wisely and have a good reputation he must enjoy having guests in his home and he must be able to teach he must not be a heavy drinker or be violent he must be gentle not quarrelsome and not love money he must manage his own family well having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith, now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others, and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is accessible to us. We pray this morning that you would help us to know and understand more of you through your word. Amen. Amen. So here we are. Chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. It starts off fairly straightforwardly. Uh, in this passage, it says that uh, those who aspire to be a bishop or an overseer uh, do well. That it's something that people should aspire to. So first of all, let's kind of clarify uh, that situation. Bishop, overseer, it seems that it's interchangeable. That the word is so similar that Paul uses it uh, to describe the same kind of people. In Acts chapter 20, verses 17 and 28, it uses uh, that word interchangeably. And similarly in Titus chapter 1, uh, verses 5 and 7. So Paul is using overseer or bishop, or we would probably class that as an elder in our context, or a minister, pastor, all of those are in this kind of category and so paul is saying that a person who aspires to that position is doing something really good 
Now, it doesn't say this in the text, but I think that we need to be clear that if you're aspiring to church leadership, you're also aspiring to carry a huge responsibility, a heavy load as far as being in leadership is concerned. But what about these leaders? Well, it's quite clear, isn't it? Uh, Live a life that cannot be spoken against. So if you're a leader, you should have no flaws in your personality, no flaws in your conduct. You should live a perfect life so that nobody can accuse you of anything. I don't live up to that. (laughs) And I'm sure if they're honest, most of the other leaders here don't live up to that. But that seems to be the impression, doesn't it? Seems to be what Paul's saying. So I guess the first thing that we need to do is if we have that aspiration, then we need to check our own desire. That if we're aspiring to be in leadership, that actually we're doing it for the right kind of reasons. So it's not just something, oh, well, I fancy being in church leadership. It seems like a nice thing to do. Or I'd like to have power and control over other people. So I want to be in leadership. Surely our aspiration should be to serve God. The other thing that I think we kind of fall into the trap of and I want to warn against is that we kind of read this passage and others and and think somehow, oh, well, that applies to church leaders. So we read this in 1 Timothy 3 and we think, oh, well, that only applies to church leaders. Rubbish. It should be the way that we measure ourselves regardless of whether we are in leadership or not. The same rules should apply to our conduct whether we are leaders or members or serving in various other ways. Because it's the same, isn't it? Our conduct should be the same. The way that we speak to other people should be the same. If we are trying to be Christ-like in our lives, it shouldn't matter whether we're church members, attenders, in leadership, or anything else. If we're truly followers of Jesus, then we should live according to the guidelines that Paul gives in this passage. So what are they? Well, the specific qualifications for an overseer or in my view, for any church members are listed in verses 2 to 7. And they go something like this. The person must have a good reputation. They must be faithful in marriage. They must be self-controlled. They must be sensible. They must be well-behaved. Be friendly to strangers, able to teach, not be heavy drinkers, not be troublemakers, not put money before God, be able to manage their own families, and they should not be new followers of God. And finally, they must be well respected by all people. quite a task really isn't it when you think about it if you sit down and carefully study the criteria that Paul gives I think it's quite demanding I think it's something that actually we should sit down and really consider before we take on those roles as I said before I think if we're honest uh, not just those of us in leadership but any of us Sometimes we fail. And maybe what the rest of us should do then is to seek forgiveness and support and help for those people. Because 
We're all sinners saved by grace, aren't we? And it's very easy to sit and criticise those in leadership and say, oh, well, they should be doing this and they should be doing that. And isn't it terrible the way that they're conducting themselves? Maybe what we should be doing is praying for our leaders and supporting them and encouraging them. So let's think about one or two of these uh, different themes that Paul mentions. So, for example, the statement that says leaders must manage uh, his own family well. The word manage there is kind of easy to, I don't know if anybody's, have you ever read, I think it was sort of in the early 80s, The One Minute Manager? Do you remember that series coming out? No, just me then. Okay, it was really, really good. You could read it in a fairly short period of time and it got lots of good information in there. But this is not that type of management. That was to do with management in business. And maybe a better way of kind of describing this takes more words, okay, because it's not managing in the sense of the one minute manager it's more about compassionate governing or running things well or being the leader or directing so not being stern not being cruel not being dictatorial or tyrannical or authoritarian or anything else just guiding just managing your family and it makes sense, doesn't it, that Paul then later on in the chapter would then reflect that and say, well, actually, if you don't run your household in those kind of ways, in those loving ways, in those compassionate ways, then how can you do that in church? Because what you do in your home should be reflected in what you do in church. So there should be love, firmness, mercy and guidelines in the home in the same way that you will then use those in the church context. So I was trying to think of a summary of a way of kind of encompassing all of those criteria between verses 2 and 7 to try and help us to kind of think, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? So the best that I could come up with is to say, well, the church leader must live wisely. Must live wisely. And what I mean by that is that our lives should be tempered, should be moderated, should not contain extremes or excesses in situations. That actually we should be on a fairly even keel. In fact, we might say the word balanced. That's what we want out of a leader, isn't it? We want people who are balanced, who are moderate in the way that they approach life. So let's move back to that list then. We don't want people who are violent or quarrelsome. That's fairly obvious, isn't it? But actually, what about the other sorts of abuse that they are? Those of you who've done safeguarding training with me will know that I will mention lots of different forms of abuse. And that could be verbal. It can be physical. It can be sexual. But it can also be financial. It can be spiritual. It can be manipulative. And that's not what we want in our leaders. What we want is people in our leadership who have a deep respect for other people. And that respect comes out in the way that they speak to others. If that respect isn't there, it's probably that that person is insecure or that person is defensive or insensitive. So what do we do? We go on. Another qualification the Bible sets for leadership is that we should consider the matter of gender. 
Dun, dun, dun. So last week, David suggested, uh, as part of uh, his sermon last week, David suggested that we go and read the end of chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up to say that you did it. But I am going to ask you, what did you think when you read that passage? What came out as you read through that? What does it say? Verse 8 is an interesting one. Women should keep quiet in church. (laughs) So in chapter 3, it doesn't get any easier. It seems to be an assumption that all church leaders will be men. That's why I read from the NLT, because it seems uh, that that uses the, the male terminology. So whether people are bishops, elders, overseers, deacons, uh, the passage seems to state that a leader should be male. Okay, it's there in black and white. It says a leader should be a husband of one wife. So a man, a husband of one wife. Very straightforward, isn't it? It's going to be difficult if we carry on down that road, so I'm going to stop, okay? Now, there are different ways that we could pursue that, okay? We could say, well, that part of the Bible causes us some difficulty. So what we're going to do is we're going to ignore it because we don't like it. Or we could say, well, we're going to take a liberal view. We're going to say that actually what we should do in our modern context is reinterpret the Bible text in a way that will fit with our society and our cultural needs. And therefore, when it says in the Bible that it should be men, we need to re-understand that in a different way and understand that Paul was writing to a male-dominated society, that actually there were some issues in that culture that caused Paul to write in this way. But if we use that argument and if we reinterpret that part of the Bible, Well, doesn't that mean that if we do that for that passage, then it should open up the possibility for us to reinterpret other parts of the Bible and changing our understanding of what the Bible says? Okay, well, let's go to the other extreme then. Let's take a good old conservative evangelical view that says basically the text is what the text is. And the text says it's men only, and that's how we should work as a church. Some people have interpreted this passage to mean that we should only have married men in our church leadership. So if anybody's going to have a position of leadership, they first of all should be men, and secondly, they should be married. And if you're not married, well, you shouldn't be in leadership. And I don't think that's right. But that's what it says in the Bible, isn't it? We put pressure on unmarried people who are in leadership. And we say, oh, you should be married. Or we make that link between what Paul is saying in Timothy. People who are aspiring to leadership, we start putting all sorts of pressure on them. And do you know what? I think that's abusive. I think that's one of the things that we should avoid doing. Because the reality is, that Paul and Timothy wouldn't have been able to be in leadership if it was only limited to married men. Why? 
because they were single. So the most likely understanding, if I can try and give you a sense of that, is probably, in Paul's case, he was writing to people to say, you should be married to one woman at once. Okay? Because he was trying to stand against the culture in Ephesus that said, basically, you could live how you liked and you could have more than one wife and you could basically do whatever you liked. Okay, so there was a reason why Paul was writing it in that way. But what about us here today in the 21st century? What do we do about those difficult subjects? How do we respond even to this idea? Well, you've been married more than once. You've been divorced. You can't be in leadership because you've got previous history. It's tough, isn't it? It's difficult when the Bible brings these things up and we don't really know what to do with them. And I want to tell you, the solution is not just to ignore them. We've done that for far too long at church where we just kind of, well, we don't really talk about that part of the Bible because it causes us some difficulty. No, we need to deal with these difficult situations. And maybe what we need to say is, well, actually, yes, it is difficult. Maybe we need not to um, kind of advise people too easily to enter into divorces but maybe we need to understand that sometimes it goes wrong or maybe we need to know that people need support because we don't always know both sides of the story and is it right if somebody is in a marriage and behind closed doors that person is being abused in some way and we say, oh, well, let's pray for you because God's told you to stay in that situation. How dare we? How dare we? So there's no easy answer to the difficult situations. The tension remains, doesn't it? It's not easy to understand sometimes what the Bible is saying. Is it only men in leadership? Is it only married men in leadership? Is it only married men who've been with the same person for all of their lives? Yes, marriage is a lifelong commitment. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should just accept divorce in any situation. But when somebody is wrestling with these situations, when perhaps a relationship is irreparable, where the best that we can do is to try and support somebody in a loving way, in a biblical way, to talk to them, to help them, to guide them as best we can. So what are we going to do with this passage? If we can't ignore it, we need to do something with it. Unless, of course, we do only have married men in our leadership. What do you think? You're not sure. You're not quite sure whether we should... Should we, do, should we agree with that? Should we disagree with that? Okay? I think the first thing to say, the important thing to say, is clearly Paul has got a deep, deep concern that the church has the right leaders. Okay, the extensive qualifications that he lists are not there just as a set of rules. They're there to give guidance, to help us to know the sorts of people that we should be seeking in our churches. That those that are charged with the responsibility of selecting the leadership are also responsible. For example, we have 
a church AGM. We mentioned the excitement of, of having our annual general meeting in a couple of weeks. But did you know that we should be prayerfully considering who we should put forward as trustees, who we should put forward uh, to fulfil those roles of leadership? So that's the first thing. We should prayerfully consider who we put forward for those roles. And then, in the weeks before the meeting, we should be praying that God will guide us, that God will help us to vote for the right people, the people that he wants to be in those positions. Sadly, I think that what's much more likely to happen is that we'll arrive at the church business meeting completely unprepared and just vote based on our feelings. Wouldn't it be so much better if we were serious, if we prayerfully considered as we elect people into leadership? So, leadership. I think that the way forward is to re-understand, to try and figure out what this part of the Bible might be saying. So we've talked about um, the similarities between overseers and bishops, and then in the passage in 1 Timothy, it goes on to say something like, in the same way, deacons uh, should also be men worthy of respect. That they should be tested. Okay? And the testing is not like an exam or a qualification in deaconship or a degree in trusteeship. But it's a testing, a kind of a way of proving that somebody is appropriate for that role. So by the way that somebody acts, by the way that they speak to other people, the attitude that they have. So before people are even accepted as deacons, they should prove themselves in the community of believers. They should not be somebody who speaks harshly. They should not be somebody who is disagreeable or argumentative. So here we go. Verse 11. Let's go for this. Let's see if we can understand what Paul might have been saying. So the uh, verse 11 is kind of one of those hinges maybe that would help us to understand, okay? It says something like, in the same way their wives, in most translations... Yes? No? Nobody's looking at the Bible? Okay. You have to take my word for it then. The women. women. Okay, that is a better understanding, I believe, of what Paul was trying to get at. If you read the NIV, the NLT, the King James Version, uh, it will say something like, the deacons, or the overseers, as we've said before, and then it will use the word their wives. Okay, T-H-E-I-R, their wives. There is an argument that says that it shouldn't be like that. That actually, in the Greek text, the T-H-E-I-R is not there. It's something that's been added in translation that actually what Paul is saying is the women in general. Okay? Now, let's not disregard the rest of the passage because it seems to be that Paul is saying in the context of verses 8 to 12 uh, that it's talking about the wives of male deacons. Okay? I get that. But... Part of the problem that we have is that when the Bible was written, they didn't have it. It must have been great, you know. I'd have loved it 
in biblical times because you didn't have capital letters, you didn't have punctuation, you didn't have sentences or paragraphs or whatever. It was just written. It would have been ace. Okay? But the fact is that there is this kind of suggestion about it being about wives. But I think what we need to do then is to kind of reference to other places in the Bible. So Romans 16, 1 is an example. Talks about somebody called Phoebe, a deaconess, not a wife of a deacon, but a deaconess, a leader in her own right. In the same passage in Romans uh, 16, verse 2, Paul mentioned a married couple who were his fellow workers. And that being the case, it probably means that they were in leadership, that they were jointly leading a group of people. So I think that maybe we can say that particular part that for years we've kind of banged on about, oh, well, it's about men. Maybe it's not. It doesn't take away the fact that those criteria are there. But regardless of whether they are male or female, the attitude, the conduct should be the same. They should exhibit self-control as a leader. They ought to possess sound judgment. They should be balanced in their conduct. Dare I say, they should have common sense. Each of these qualities is required of who? Yes, it's talking about leaders, but I don't believe that that is just it. I think that it should be about all of us. So whatever the way of understanding it, the reality is that Paul was keen that everybody acted in a right way, that everybody was just as responsible for their conduct as everybody else. There's no excuse for critical attitudes. There's no excuse for being abusive to other people or talking to other people in a wrong kind of manner in our churches. We should exercise self-control. We should be tempered in the way that we speak to people. <coughs> Clearly, um, the women in Ephesus were not able to uh, teach at that time, okay, in the formal sense. It's very clear that's what the Bible says, okay? But maybe that was because of their conduct at that time. Maybe Paul was speaking into a particular situation at that time. So my proposition is that we should have women in leadership. Because I don't believe that Paul was banning that. Because clearly, Phoebe and um, the other two mentioned in Romans 16 there were leaders. They were acting in that way. And if we become that narrow that we miss out on the input of an important section of our church, then we're doing ourselves a disservice. But what I think it does do is, and what I think Paul is trying to do, is he's trying to describe the role or the function more than defining who should be in that office or that position when referring to deacons or bishops or overseers. Because if you take it to its ultimate, if you really, really want to interpret this in the correct way, as it were, the original term that's used for deacons, bishops, overseers, is slave or servant. And I don't see many of us being 
in that role? Are we really servants in leadership? Are we really thinking of ourselves as the slaves of others? The title, the name, it's not really important. What is important is the function, isn't it? What's important is recognising that somebody else fulfilling that role already. That's what it means when Paul says about testing people. It's not about an exam. It's about recognising that somebody is fulfilling that role already and we as a church need to recognise that that person is doing that thing. So it's not about should deacons or overseers be male or female. It's more about seeing that person's Christian discipleship, the way that God is using them, the way that God has moulded them, the way that God has developed them, the attitude that they have in their lives. Surely that is what is important and that's what we should be aspiring to in our church. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, for your word. Would you help us to wrestle with it? When we see these passages that we're not quite sure what to do with, would you give us understanding? Would you help us to really think through what it is saying to us in the 21st century? And God, we thank you for our leadership team here. We pray for them. We ask that you would guide them, that you would equip them in the way that it is listed in this passage. Lord, would you help us as we serve your church and serve each other, that you would change our attitude, that you would change the way that we behave as we bring ourselves to you, God. Would you help us? Amen. Peter.